Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we are on topic six, lesson two, null hypothesis significance testing. As I said in the last lesson, this can be a very, very difficult concept for students to get. Try to pay close attention, sorry, to what I talk about in this lesson. Go back through it if you need to again and come out of this topic understanding null hypothesis significance testing as best you can because it's going to be important for the rest of the class. And as I said, it's a difficult topic for a lot of students to grasp. Okay. In the last lesson, we talked about scientific proof. And I want to just remind you a little bit about this. So what we talked about is that theories and the hypotheses that are based on them. And remember, theories are coherent explanations for some phenomenon, and hypotheses are predictions based on those theories. Theories and hypotheses cannot be proven, but they can be disproven. And what we're trying to do in null hypothesis significance testing is to disprove an hypothesis. Null hypothesis significance testing is the basis of understanding how scientific proof or truth comes about. It is the way that we create knowledge. And how we do that is to take an idea, an hypothesis, and test it to determine whether it survives the test or does not. What we seek to do in null hypothesis significance testing is to disprove an hypothesis. And this is, I think, where null hypothesis significance testing becomes confusing because we tend to think about we want to support or prove or demonstrate. We do papers uh, in which we try to make a point and prove something or demonstrate something because we can't prove anything, remember? Um, we're asked to uh, read articles where the person is making an argument and trying to demonstrate something. In null hypothesis significance testing, we take the opposite approach. We're trying to disprove an idea. And we're not, from doing that, trying to give support to an alternate idea, although the process of disproving an idea eliminates a poor idea, an unwarranted idea, and supporting a, a hypothesis or not disproving the hypothesis, you can sort of think that that does give support to the hypothesis. What we really have to think is that it doesn't disprove it. And that's a strange way of thinking, given that most everything else we do in terms of argument is that we're trying to support an argument rather than disprove one. All right, what is a null hypothesis? So here we go. Remember this, we had it in the last lesson, the theory that language shapes perception. This is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, but this is, we're calling it a theory. The hypothesis that we worked with is individuals are better able to distinguish between colors if the language has more color terms. That hypothesis should support this theory that language shapes perception. We have this as H sub 1, as the working or research hypothesis. We sometimes might have that as H sub R. The null hypothesis would be here, H naught. There is no difference in the ability to perceive colors based on the number of color terms in the language. It's basically null, nothing. Nothing's going on, no difference, no pattern, no nothing. And that's basically always what a null hypothesis is, no nothing. It's that that we want to disprove. We don't want to show that the research hypothesis is true or is supported. We want to show that the null hypothesis is not correct. 
And by doing that, we support the research hypothesis. Again, this, I think, is difficult to get into our brains because we're so often trying to show that our research idea, we can demonstrate that it is supported or true. We're doing the opposite here. We're taking the opposite, essentially, of the research hypothesis and trying to disprove that. And by disproving that, we give support for our research hypothesis. Rewind this, play it again, think about it. That's null hypothesis significance testing. So the null hypothesis is typically the opposite of the test or research hypothesis. Null hypothesis is usually the opposite. Um, the null hypothesis usually is related in some way to a random pattern. And that's where we get into probability. The null hypothesis is usually that there's no relationship, no difference, no pattern here. The research hypothesis is predicting a pattern, predicting a relationship. Language, uh, the ability to distinguish um, colors, by the number of terms in the language. That's predicting essentially a correlation, right? That there will be a correlation between the number of, of color terms in a language and the ability of individuals speaking that language to distinguish colors. That's predicting a pattern, an association. The null hypothesis is that there's no pattern, there's no association. Because that essentially predicts a random pattern, we can use probability to determine whether the null hypothesis is supported or disproven. So let's talk a little bit about random patterns. A random pattern is what's expected by probability. It's what you would expect in the world most of the time. The random pattern is what forms a normal curve. And again, that's what we normally have as H naught, as the null hypothesis. A random pattern, a normal curve. Not a relationship, not a pattern. Non-random patterns differ from expectations, because the expectation is randomness based on probability. We can estimate how much a pattern differs from randomness, and that gives us a probabilistic way of saying the likelihood that, uh, of a pattern being true. Get that? Okay, let's look at something we've seen before. Going back to the BOAS data set, we're going to see this all the time. We've seen exactly these. This is age and height for those who are under 21. And we talked about this, there is a relationship here. It is a positive, pretty much linear relationship here. This is the adults over the age of 21, height versus age. And there's no pattern here. That's a random pattern. It, it is just people have grown to whatever their height is. It doesn't matter what their age is. Age isn't changing their height anymore. This is a random pattern. This is a linear, positive linear pattern. And we calculated correlation coefficients for this that show that. Remember, a correlation coefficient goes from minus 1 to 1, depending on its strength. And the closer it is to minus 1 for a negative correlation or plus 1 for a positive correlation tells us how strong that relationship is. This is a very strong relationship with a correlation coefficient close to 1. This is a very weak relationship. It's essentially random with a correlation coefficient of about zero. All right. Significance, null hypothesis significance testing. A significant difference from random is very unlikely in probability theory. Probability theory says that a Random pattern is what we expect. We expect a correlation coefficient of zero. 
and a real pattern correlation coefficient closer to minus one or one in the example we just looked at stature and age uh, for young people is very unlikely in random data. There must be something going on there. There is some relationship going on. Some process is happening under there to create that pattern. For null hypothesis significance testing, unlikely is sort of arbitrarily, but in the next lesson you'll see why it's not purely arbitrary, is arbitrarily sort of defined as being uh, as occurring less than 5% of the time in otherwise random data. If you took random data and you pulled out a sample and then, for example, in height and, and age, you plotted it out, if you got a pattern that would occur less than 5% of the time in that ra if the data were truly random, that's considered significant. And if you get a significant result, you reject the null hypothesis. Say that again. A significant result will occur less than 5% of the time if the data you're looking at are truly random. We expect randomness. The null hypothesis is basically that there's a random pattern, regardless of what the specific null hypothesis is. It basically is that it assumes a random pattern. So, if we find a pattern that is less likely than 5% chance that it will occur looking at what otherwise are random data, we say that's significant. And if it's significant, we reject the null hypothesis. This can be confusing again for students because we're looking at low probability as being what we sort of want to find in order to reject the null hypothesis. It again seems almost backwards. We want to argue a point. Our, our research hypothesis is what we sort of want to argue. That's how we write papers and we make arguments. We typically think about a good argument, the result that we want to support an argument is the one that has the most support, is the most likely. Null hypothesis significance testing is essentially the opposite, where we make the argument that nothing is going on and what ends up actually supporting our ideas is if we show that that's wrong, that it's wrong that nothing is going on, something is going on. All right. Again, rewind this, think of that again, if you want to. So what we show that as P, probability, is less than 0 0.05 or 5%. It'll occur less than five times in 100 in random data. So let's look at the two plots we just saw. Here we have the random data, OK? In this random data, the probability of getting this in random data is one time out of 10, 0.11. Actually, that's pretty low probability. And the reason for that is that the sample size is so big. And we'll talk about that in the next lesson. But this is greater than 0 0.05, and therefore, this was a pattern we got in some kind of data, we would accept the null hypothesis and say that the research hypothesis must be wrong. The probability of finding this in random height and age data is teeny. It's actually 2 to the minus 16th. So it is 0 0.16 zeros it's very, very unlikely to find this in random data. If our hypothesis was that we would find this, that's our null hypothesis, and we find this, we would reject that null hypothesis and give support, say that this supports the research hypothesis. It does not prove the research hypothesis. It gives it support, and we can go in and keep testing.
that research hypothesis. Okay, so got that? If we hypothesize that there is a relationship between age and height, and we get this that's essentially a random pattern, this that probability theory based on a correlation would say happen would happen 10 times in 100 if we just selected all of these people out of random data then we say it's random that's random we accept the null hypothesis and we say that the research hypothesis is not supported if we found this by choosing a bunch of people out of random data we found this relationship with a probability of occurring in random data less than 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2 is what this actually is, but less than ever. We would say, well, the null hypothesis that there's no relationship is wrong. We reject it. And we say, well, our research hypothesis has some support. See how this is kind of a backward way of thinking, and that's why it's so confusing. But that's null hypothesis significance testing. Null hypothesis significance testing. H naught is what's expected. We expect it to have probability greater than or within the realm of 0.95. H1 is unexpected. We expect that to happen less than 0.05% of the time. And really, this, this should be 0.05. I have it as 95. It's within that 95% range. That's unexpected, H1. And so if H0 is true, in other words, it happens 95% of the time or more, then H1 is rejected. The research hypothesis is rejected, and the hypothesis is considered to be unsupported. But if H1 is true, then H0 is rejected, and the hypothesis is supported. That would be if we have an occurrence that, by probability, would say it would occur less than five times in 100 in random data. OK. Null hypothesis significance testing Go back, watch this video again, try and be sure that you understand this. It is very strange logic and that what we are doing is testing the opposite of what our research hypothesis is in the hope of rejecting that opposite and that says we have support for our research hypothesis. And that's done by finding a very low probability relationship or pattern or uh, whatever we, we are looking for rather than a, what we would expect under random data. Got that? It is a difficult set of concepts. Think about it, read about it, watch the videos. We're going to come back and talk about one more aspect of null hypothesis significance testing in the next lesson, which is about errors. And I'll see you then.